Excellent. Okay. So today's video lab is going to be a extension or it's going to build from our prior lab. So in our prior lab, we had built a REST API for on the server side with endpoints. And effectively, an API is no different than APIs that you've probably developed in other programming languages like Java. It's just the difference between a REST API and a tra traditional API is that you don't download it into your local system. You send your, uh, your request for data over an HTTP connection. So in order to emphasize that, we've already had one lab prior where we built a REST client. That was the quiz game. But here we're gonna build also a, a REST client, but we're gonna do it off the REST API that we designed last lab for our multiplayer high-low game. So by the end of this lab, we'll have both the back end and the front end that we have designed and will utilize. So here, instead of using someone else's uh, back end services, we'll use our own. So a general breakdown for this lab is we'll do a quick lab introduction and a lot of the introductory points, uh, this is not correct, but let's delete these. Um, this is gonna be more like you know async and DOM related stuff. So we'll look at uh, all of the, um, the responsibilities that a client side application is going to do have inside of being able to use a REST API. And again, we've already seen this before, so I'll just kind of be re-motivating, reasserting what we've talked about. Uh, then after that, we'll talk about how to design a client that consumes REST API services. And so when we talk about design, we're gonna talk about actually mocking up our views and making decisions of what is gonna happen in each side, inside of each view. So as you start to build out part three of your, uh, your final project document, you can use this lab as a reference point for that in terms of building out your front end uh, user stores. So, Based off of the API, our game's gonna have a couple different views. We're going to have a main menu view that will be the landing page that the user will go ahead and uh, land on. And, that, and then from the main menu, you can have the option to create a new game. So we'll go ahead and implement that new view. And then that will be the first time that we'll actually have to go ahead and request a backend service. When we need to create a new game, we actually have to get the server to make the game for us and deliver us the necessary information. So we'll fetch some information from the backend and then we'll build a join game view. And then after we build the view, then we'll go ahead and implement the fetch to our backend service to go ahead and get the data we need to power that view to get that game data. And then after that, we'll create an actual game view. And after we create the game view, then we'll figure out how to fetch the backend to actually produce the request we need, which is going to be able to submit a guest to the game at that stage. Then we'll create a game overview. And then again, in order, uh, the, the options you would have in a game overview would be to go ahead and fetch the back end to be able to reset the game. And then we'll have a quick game option. And that'll be it. That would be essentially the entire uh, set of uh, a life cycle of what a high low uh, multiplayer guess the number game would be like. So again, the related lab that you're going to need to have completed would be the one we did last lecture or last uh, lab video. So just a quick, quick little introduction here. And again, these are a lot of concepts you'll already be familiar with. The prereqs to this lab, well, was the REST API server endpoints. And it's not just that you had to do it, we'll actually have to run that server on local host. So you can't do this lab without having that lab complete and running in the background. And so again, we're gonna have it running a local host listing on for 3000. Okay, so the motivation here is we wanna build that multiplayer number uh, guessing game. Um, let's call this instead of number, high, low. There we go. So we wanna build a multiplayer high, low game that uses uh, the 
that where the users play from the web browser. And so our goal here will be to design and implement a front end client for our high low uh, game that makes use of the REST API. So learning objectives here. So by the end of this lab, we will have used async await and fetch to be able to go ahead and send our requests to our backend service. We'll do more DOM manipulation to update our viewport. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the responsibilities and roles of a REST client. Uh, we'll make use of JSON data on the client side. Again, uh, we were making use of it last lab on the server side. And we'll go ahead and utilize an MDC software architecture for designing out our uh, front end application. And so here we'll also talk about strategies to be able to design and develop the front end portion of your uh, full stack application. So just some quick notes here in terms of our client side architecture. We want to start this project by making a project folder with all of our assets and scripts and organize it as such. So here I called this number guesser client. I'm going to call it high low client. I like that better. Let me see where I'm at in here. There's not working directory. Okay, perfect. So I am, let's go back. Last. Okay, perfect. So let's clear this. So I'm going to Make sure that I'm not in my high low server. I want to be in my own directory. So let's make a new directory. We're going to call this high low client. Oh, let's make sure we spell client correctly. Excellent. Okay, so now I have the server and I have the client. And let me go into here. I'm going to change directories into my client, and I'm going to just follow this outline so I have all of these uh, made. So the first thing I'm going to need is I'm going to need that index.html. So I now have an index.html, perfect. Then I'm going to make a directory that is my scripts directory. Okay, so now I have a scripts directory. Then I'm going to go ahead and inside of my scripts directory, I'm going to create a data.js file. Okay. I'm going to create a views.js file. Okay. I'll create a controllers.js file. And then finally, I will create a game.js file. Excellent. And obviously, data is where we can manage data. Game would have all the game logic. Views will have all the uh, viewing logic to render contents to our viewport inside of our DOM and controllers will uh, set up all of our callback functions that's going to trigger the game logic to do things. The general breakdown is that the controllers and views can inspect and tell game to do things, but the game is unaware that these other JS files exist. And this allows us to be able to create any number of controllers and views that can operate on the same game.js uh, file without having to ever modify it or refactor it. Okay. And I think the last thing is from this perspective, so now that I have my files made, let me actually go to um, the server and I'm gonna run my server now so I don't forget to do that. Okay. so. I, the background on my server, I'm going to have running in this uh, bash terminal. So here I should be ls. Yep, there it is. So let me do npm start. And there we go. Our server is now running. Perfect. And we'll just let that run on in the background as we build out our front end. Okay, so some just some some brief mentions about concepts. Uh, again, this lab's key focus is on the concept of REST architecture and REST APIs. And so, what we mean by that is just it's a common approach for backend services to interface with other backend or frontend uh, services or apps. And so here we're going to focus on building a front end application that's going to send requests to our back end for data and not web pages. That's the big thing about an API. We're looking for data. 
and not HTML documents. And so that's why we use the term uh, API. It's just a collection of pre-implemented functions and methods the developer can import or invoke. The only difference between this API and any other one that you've used is the fact that instead of installing it locally, you just send your request through the internet. We already talked about what REST is. That's the mechanism in which we interface with the API and the endpoints are what we use to communicate with the backend system to send out our requests and receive back our data. And so our oh, Apple app, we can make use of it. You had a question? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Do that. Um, and then from the client side consideration points, we have async await, where the asynchronous JavaScript just allows us to use promises and it allows us to go ahead and invoke functions and not have to wait for the result, like in a default asynchronous uh, function. So uh, when a promise resolves, it triggers a callback. And again, the two asynchronous functions we're gonna use is gonna be fetch, which we've seen before. It allows us to send HTTP requests from the browser side. And the then, uh, which allows us to go ahead and attach a callback to a fetch if we wanted to. Uh, we don't have to do that either. We could do um, just uh, two await functions side by side without the then. And then we're going to make use of JSON again, because that's what the server is going to deliver to us. So we'll parse our JSON data so that we can actually use it inside of our app. And then we'll make use of the document object model to be able to update the viewport of our browser so that we can go ahead and create a single page application by overriding the HTML elements that are currently there to build out our different views. Again, these are a lot of concepts we saw previously when we built the other REST client, which was the quiz game. The big difference here is instead of depending on someone else's API, we're going to depend on our own. So let's talk about the design for our client for a high low game. So at this point, you should only be operating with pencil and paper, right? So before coding anything, client side or server side, you should first plan out. Now for the client side, you should plan out what are your views, what are your controls, and what are your logic. That's why MVC really helps establish a good plan for us uh, uh, in terms of separating those responsibilities. Because when we go to create our specification report, and so, um, we're going to figure out what the views, controls, and logics that we intend to use and how those clients can interface with our backend service and how the client will then interface with the user, right? So our client is the middle point between two different entities. One is the end user and the other is going to be the server. So when we think of what are the user stories, what is the journey that a user will take throughout our application, we can create mock-ups of that. So for instance, our entire application will be predicated off of five different views. So I'm gonna create a mock-up that's gonna number each view one through five and the transition from one view to another, I'm gonna indicate inside of this descriptor here. So here's a mock-up of our main menu view. This would be the starting point for our application. Notice anytime that there's a way to maneuver to leave this view and enter another view, I'm going to declare that as an option. So I have two buttons here, new game and join. So that's two options, new game and, and join game. And so if I'm going to leave this view to go to another, then I'm going to specify what view it brings me to. So option one brings me to view two, whereas option two brings me to view three. So view, uh, view number two is our game menu. It has two inputs, right? A min and max value, and it has a start button. So that's gonna be one option. It only pro produces one option for us to leave. And the real role of this view is to be able to have the end user request a new game from the backend server. And so when they do, we can then go to view four. We won't do that yet. We're just gonna go this in, uh, in consecutive order, but understand we would jump from here to here then. Let's see, so view number three, is our game menu view. And so here, our input would be a game ID. And the point of this view would be to be able to let the end user request game data from the backend server. 
And there's one option, just like in uh, view two, to be able to join a game. So here, there's gonna be one of two things that can happen, right? If it's a valid ID, we will go to view four into our game view. If it's an invalid ID, then we'll go back to uh, view one on an error. So it'll just go back to the option to go to new game or join game. For view four, that'll be our game view. It has one input where you can put in a guess. Uh, again, the point of this view is to be able to request a guess. The end user can request to make a guess into the game to the backend server. And so there, there's one option, which is to submit your guess. And so after you submit, your, the application is either going to stay on view number four, which is our game view, or it will transition to view number five, which is going to be the game over menu. So our game over menu uh, itself has two different options, right? Two buttons, a replay and a main menu. On the option of uh, uh, replaying, we go back to our game view, so that would be four, and on the option of two, which is main menu, it would bring us back to view number one. And so that produces an entire user journey from the time that they first enter our application to the time that they, they exit back or loop back around. So again, this is a good proof of concept for what your uh, front end design document should look like. Okay, so let's now move on to starting to build out our application. The first goal that we're gonna have is we wanna create the main menu view. So here we are gonna use our mockup. So based on that mockup, the main menu offers two options, a create to create a new game and to join an existing game. So here we're actually going to implement our index.html page where we'll define our view element and import our JavaScript scripts, right? Then after we do that, I don't think we're going to touch our HTML ever again. We'll modify it strictly from all of our JavaScript files. So inside of our views, we'll then define a function that renders the HTML that we want for the main menu of view into the view element. And then we'll also go ahead and tell the Windows uh, object to load and invoke when the Windows object initially loads into the page, we'll invoke the main menu uh, function or load that into the DOM. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the index.html content. So let's go over here. Oh my. Perfect. Okay, so um, uh, let's go into client. So let's open this into our editor. Oops. go and let's go to scripts we'll just get everything loaded right now so as we come across it we can go ahead and implement so i'm going to open up index controllers data game js and views js perfect okay so now i'm going to go to index.js i mean i'm sorry index.html and we're actually going to put together some of our HTML code. Actually, so that's, yeah. Okay, there we go. And just so that it's completely legal the way we, we would expect, we'll make sure we'll just put the, an empty head and we'll also do HTML there, perfect. Okay, so inside of our HTML, we're gonna have our head and our body. We're not gonna bother putting anything in our head. We're just gonna build ugly, ugly HTML contents for this lab, just as a proof of concept. So we can focus more on the restful calls. So here we'll have a heading that says uh, number guessing game, then we'll create a div that will give the ID view. And that's gonna be where we attach ourselves and update the view for our game. And then everything else will be controlled by the JavaScript. So I'll go ahead and I'll attach our four JavaScript files, the data, the views, the game, and the controllers. Excellent. So at this point, if I were to, um, let's see here. If I was to then go to here, 
I will now have yeah my number of guessing game. So I have my header right there. And at oh, as of now, I'll just go ahead and use localhost. I mean, I'll just use file protocol right now, and we'll see if it yells at me or not, and whether I have to pivot over to HTTP. Okay, and so what we see here is, yep, our server is running perfect. We haven't made any calls to it yet, though, uh, because all its role is is to be able to deliver us content that we might need. Uh, and actually, it's possible for me to be running two servers at once. I don't know if I've talked about that, but I might have one server that's on port 3000 that I send requests to to be able to get data into my uh, front end. But then I might have a server hosting my front end on a different port where that server is just responsible for serving the HTML documents. So that's a concept that you can kind of think of as what's called a microserver architecture, where as opposed to having a monolithic application that's all hosted in one place, we can subdivide our application across tiny services that kind of cross communicate between each other in terms of their responsibilities. Okay, so now that we have our index.html, well, why don't we start implementing some of our JavaScript? So the first thing we need to do is actually create what the main menu contents are gonna be so we can render it. So Docker is a little, so there's a question, is that what Docker sort of uh, maintains? So Docker is typically more used from my experiences in DevOps. One cool thing about Docker is that you can create a custom runtime environment that has all of your dependencies effectively pre-installed into an OS, and it allows you to bundle up that, that OS and be able to launch it out. So the idea behind what most Docker instances allow you to do is, you can, when, when you download them and run them, you can then run applications from the go without having to know how to configure them. And so Docker is sometimes used for deployment of microservices, right? But it, it's, it's more of a, a environmental scheme to get you as a developer up and running and all of your team up and running without having to all have to install software. It allows a uniform, uh, set of tooling across a team without the team having to have a lot of legwork in coordinating that. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah. So let us go into our views. And so we're going to go into the view script and we're going to create a function that's going to allow us to render the main menu. So we'll go to views here and we will make a function. And so all this function is going to do is it's going to grab the view element from the document object, right, using that get element by ID. And then we're going to create a string that's going to represent the HTML that we want to display into that view. So it's going to create a section that has those two buttons, right? One is going to be a new game button. The other is going to be a join game button. And we're going to give those buttons IDs so that we can access them inside of our, inside of our, um, JavaScript uh, uh, environment. And then we're going to take that string, right, that the, containing the HTML, and we'll just go ahead and we'll overwrite the view's current set of HTML elements with that. Right. And so now, once we do that, I'm also going to go ahead and set the main menu function to be the callback function for when the window object initially loads the web page. So I'm gonna do that as the very last line of my, of my views. So here the window object has an onload function. This event triggers when the page is initially load, uh, when it initially loads. And so we're gonna provide a reference to this main menu function so that when the page does load, it will go ahead and render our two buttons. So let me see if I, yep, and see when I refresh, I can now get a new game and a join game button. 
perfect. Here, just in case I want, I'll open up DevTools. I don't need it now, but we can kind of start to see how if I look at view now, it has a section and there's my button ID, or my buttons with the IDs and the contents, the labels. Excellent. Okay, and we just tested that already and it's working. So that means we can move on to our next phase where we actually wanna go ahead and um, create our new game view. So here, what we're going to do obviously is uh, manipulate the DOM and we'll also have to set up an event listener so that when the, but when the user presses this button, when the user presses a new game button, it's going to overwrite the current contents of view with the new contents of, well, whatever our, our next view is going to be, which is going to be the new game view. So in order to do that, it's gonna be four different steps. We're gonna to have to go ahead and, and assign a new function inside of our views script, which is going to go ahead and uh, render whatever the elements are for a new game menu. And then we'll have to update our controller script to actually define a function that'll map a callback to the buttons so that when the user presses them, it actually does something. It has, actually has a callback function that responds to a button click. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and um, set those callback functions inside of our views when we initially build out those views. Okay, so let's do the first step. Let's go into our views and actually create a function much very similar to what we, we did before here, where we'll, we'll call it new game menu. And it's just a function that's going to grab a reference of the view element. It's gonna create an HTML string that contains the contents of the HTML. And then here we're, we're gonna set the HTML into the view. Okay, so once I do that, I'm going to have to go into my controllers to actually be able to tell the view what callbacks should be assigned to each of these buttons, because we haven't done any callback logic yet. So let me go into controllers. So I'm going to create this getter method that's going to be, which is going to allow an external uh, script to get a particular callback. So let, let's actually create this callback function, new game menu, and then I'll talk about what get uh, callbacks is doing. So let's go here and actually build out um, game, new game menu. Oh, was that, uh, oh, that was, we already built that. That was inside of our views here. New game menu, perfect. Okay, so the idea is that when I click on new game, I want to trigger this new game menu. Like for instance, if I were to go to console right now, oh, let me save this and refresh. So if I were to go to console now and type in new game menu and then invoke that, right? It, it updates the view, to the view that would be the start where you could put in a starting value and label where you put an ending value and then a start button. So we want that this method to get triggered in response to when we press that button. And since this is a control, that, that should happen inside of controllers. So here I'm gonna create a get callbacks function. And all it does is it's gonna return an object. But if I want a bat arrow function to return an arrow, a, 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 um, a function, I can't just use the curly braces because that's the same symbol we also use to declare code blocks. And since that's a valid thing to have after a fat arrow, to have a multi-line function, if we want it to be treated as an object instead, we can wrap it in between parentheses to say, this is a object, this isn't a code block. and then. I'm going to put a key. The key is going to be the ID of that button, right? So for the new game button. So again, if I go into my views, 
you'll see that I have a button that's called new game button. Okay. So for the new game button, the callback that I want to be assigned to that based on my controllers is going to be the new game menu function, which is this one here, defined in views. Excellent. And so we'll keep updating this get callbacks each time we want to assign a callback function to one of our buttons. That's the strategy we're going to use to be able to do that. Okay. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and add a, uh, inside of our controllers, a function that will actually do the work of adding a controller. So our add controller function is going to allow for variable length arguments, which means that it could be one, it could be two, it could be however many that it needs to be at any given time. So we can use the spread operator inside the parameter list to declare that. And so what we're looking for is a collection of button IDs. Then what we're going to do is we're going to invoke this method to get the callbacks. And all that's getting for us is a object containing a key value pair where it's going to be the button IDs and then the associated callback functions for each of those button IDs. So here, callbacks then will have a reference of that object. Then, since this could be one or more than one, this could be any number of button IDs, we're going to do a for loop for each ID inside of our collection of button IDs. We will ask the DOM to get that ID for us and we'll save that HTML element as a button. And since that's an HTML element that we now have access to from the DOM, we can invoke the add event listener to it. And we wanna add a click event to it. And the click event we wanna to add to it, it's gonna be in that callbacks function. I mean, that callbacks uh, object. And it's going to be at the key, which is the ID of the HTML element. Excellent. So now this is a function that will allow the views or external uh, scripts inside of our application to be able to add a controller to any given HTML element, given it has an ID. And now what I want to do is I want to go into my views and I want to go ahead and refactor it. I want to add a line that is now going to add that controller to the ID we defined here. So for, to the new game button. So let me go to the views here. So under main menu, right? What I wanna do is I want to go ahead and after I render that button, right? I gotta do it after it exists. I am then going to invoke the controller uh, script to add controller and it's going to pass it the ID new game button. So now if I refresh here and if I click that should now have an event listener that then invokes the new game menu, which it does. Perfect. So now we're able to responsively go ahead and update our DOM. And again, this is just this is just building off concepts we've done previously. And so here we're going to assess. And when you click the new game, it does exactly that. Perfect. So let's move on to our next iteration where we can actually start making use of our back end service. So here, what we're going to want to do is when we're inside of the new game, let's go back over here. So when I get to this view where I have the option to put in a start and put in an end and then click start, well, I'm going to, that, that is going to cause a fetch to our backend service, right? We, we can't start a game on the client side. We have to rely on the backend server to start the game up for us. So that's what we're gonna do in this iteration. And so here, what we're gonna do, this can be broken down into effectively six different steps and we'll just walk through each of them. This is just a quick overview of them 
but I'll, I'll walk through them one at a time. So the first thing we want to do is inside of our data uh, script, we're just going to go ahead and declare all of the game variables that we want to manage. So we'll keep our data separate from all the other logic so that we can easily find it without having to go into other scripts. And that's one reason why when we declared all of our uh, scripts, we, we want to have that one first so that that's available for all the, and in fact, if I wanted to, I could put that in the head and guarantee that it preloads before anything else. Okay, so inside of here, we're going to create four different variables. We're going to create a game ID, which is going to be the uh, ID of the game from the backend service that we're currently going to play. We're going to have a variable that's going to represent the min and the max for this particular game, and then also a variable to control whether the game is over or not. Okay, so now that we have our game data defined, we're going to go ahead and go into our controllers and actually define some functions that are going to get the min and max values from the inputs. So let's go into our controllers here. And so here I'm going to create a function get min. And all it does is it's going to access the element inside of our DOM that has the ID min value. And then that's going to be a input uh, uh, element. So it'll have a value attribute. And so we'll just return that value attribute. And we'll do the same thing for get max. But instead of using the ID min value, we'll use the ID max value. So those will be two helper functions for us. Let me make sure that actually when I do this, these are in alignment. Perfect. And then the next thing I want to do is I'm going to finally go into my game JS file, and we're actually going to start creating some functions that helps manage our game on the client side. So let's go into our game script. So here, since this is going to be requesting data from a backend service so that we can import it onto our, our client side, this is going to have to be a synchronous function because it's going to be doing a fetch. So any, any function that's using the await keyword means that that corresponding function has to be in a synchronous function. So this is going to be a start game function. And what this function is going to do is it's going to go ahead and get the min value from the input field is going to get the max value from the input field, right? But we don't want to directly access the DOM inside of our game script because that's supposed to be our model. And our model is supposed to be agnostic towards the underlying implementation of our views and controllers. So we'll get that information via a getter. And so we can mutate the state of, we can mutate the logic of our getter and our, our, our game logic won't change at all. So here we'll get our min and our max. Then what we'll do is we'll define the URL, right? The endpoint that we have to hit on the backend server to be able to start a game. So if you recall from last lab, we have the API. So our endpoint is localhost on port 3000, and then it's slash API slash game, and then new allows us to create a new game. And then we were using the search parameters, the query string. So we're going to send as a key value pair start, and that'll be the min value and end, and that'll be the max value. So once I construct a valid uh, uh, fetch, I for my URL, once I have a URL that I can fetch from that has all the data that I need to send as part of my request, I'll send that to the backend server and I'll wait until I get a response, right? And so since, this is an await keyword, it's going to return a promise object to me. And the promise object will naturally resolve once it, uh, once, once it, uh, the data is returned back to us. And so since, since um, this has an await and the next is an await, we'll wait for response to resolve before we go ahead and do this line of code. And so in this line of code, when we get a response, we will then await for the JSON to get unpacked, the returned data to get unpacked from the, the response so that we can actually get the game data. 
and we'll save that as data. And so from the data, one of the attributes we get back, as you might recall from uh, the last lab, is going to be a game ID. So we'll take that game ID and we'll save it locally. And then we're going to invoke a function that will exist inside of our view, which is going to be called view game. And so that'll update, view game will update the state of our DOM to go to that next view that we want. Okay. So now let's actually implement that view game function since we're kind of reliant on it now. So let's go into our views here and we will go ahead and define a view game. And again, in order, and what we're gonna do for the purposes of just testing is we're gonna do a console log and we're just going to uh, display the state of our data, right? Inside of data.js, game ID, min and max. We're gonna display that inside of our view game. And then the next thing I wanna do is, well, I have a start game button, right? And so obviously I wanna do that fetch with the start game button or the start game. I implemented this function. Let's, let's go back. So I implement this function in game, which is called start game. I want this function to get invoked in response of a button press here, right? But I don't have an event listener there yet. So inside of my controllers, I'm gonna to have to update so that I can bind the button ID with that callback function. So let's go ahead and update. Oh, just let me, okay. And so each time we modify this, don't forget to put a comma after the previous entry, right? So a comma there, and then we're gonna make a new key value pair. So for a start game button ID, we want the callback function associated with it to be start game, be the start game function. And then once I do that, then what I can do is I'm going to go into that current new game menu and we're going to go ahead and add a controller to that. So let's go back to our new game menu. Here, that's in our views. We have our new game menu after, after we actually create this button, that is our, our start game button ID, right? We're then going to invoke add controller and pass the ID that we want to then have the event listener attached to. Excellent. And then once we do that, we should be able to start a game and inside of our console, we're going to see the game data, the data inside of our client side mutated. The reason why we didn't update the view is this wasn't the goal to update the view. So we just did a console log as a proof of concept so we didn't want to implement too much all at once. If you want, if you want to know why we did console log here. Okay, so let me refresh this. So here, let me go to new game and let me hit start. And when I hit start, I get back a game ID and I get a start, a min and a max value. And again, this data is coming from my backend service. So if I go back and look at my, my code my server that's been running in the background all this time look the server actually produced inside of the collection of games a game that has that id and then it has oh look i can see the number 509 start zero and 1000 game over false excellent so we're actually starting to issue commands to our backend service from our client and then get them back into our client side starting to build a multi-layered application part front end part back end Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to finally go ahead and create that join game view. And again, we'll just use our JavaScript to render our HTML using the view script like we have been doing. And then we'll use the uh, controllers to be able to set up the event listeners that will have to be attached to any of the buttons. So let's start by creating a function inside of views that's going to define the contents of this view. And again, what we're designing here is typically referred to an SPA or a single page application because all of the uh, contents of the viewport are constantly being overridden inside of our JavaScript. 
So here, I'm going to create an I'm going to yeah, I'm going to create a join game uh, menu. And I'm just going to ask the DOM for the view ID. I'm going to create an HTML string that's going to contain a section. It's going to say game ID. Then it's going to have a input form, uh, input field here, where it's going to have the ID of a room code, and it's going to have the default value of game ID. And so the purpose of this is the the user would type in a game ID here. And then it will have a button. The button will have an ID of find game button. And then we'll go ahead and uh, have a label on that button join. So notice anytime we need to access anything inside of our scripts, we've been making sure to give them IDs as always. That's how we were able to get the min value and the max value. The reason why they had a starting value of zero and a thousand was because we gave them default values. I don't know if I went through line by line, but I think everyone should know the HTML well enough to be able to parse that. Anyway, once I get my HTML, I'll go ahead and uh, overwrite the view with the new set of uh, elements. Uh, nope, that's been changed. I, let me do this. Uh, that's the old implementation. So when you do this, uh, let me go back to here. Okay, let me grab this. You might have the older, uglier looking function. Oh no, yeah, it was here, just to get deleted. Perfect, let's delete the old function and replace it with the newer, cleaner. Okay, so here, all we wanna do inside of our git callbacks is go into the controllers, add a comma, and now the new callback function is going to be to invoke that join game menu, right? So that's the one of the views. We want that to, let's refresh our page. So when you go to hit join game, when you click on it, it doesn't have an event listener. But what we want it to do is trigger this new join game menu function that's in our views now. So we'll add that into our get callbacks. And so now that it's in our get callbacks, our view, can now go ahead and invoke that. Inside of the main menu function. So again, we're, we're keeping the roles of views and controllers isolated, right? We're not cross mingling them. So if I go to my views inside of my main, uh, main menu, right? I have two buttons. One that is a new game button, but now I want to implement the join game button. So inside of add controller, remember this is a variable length parameter. So I can add two IDs and that's fine. So I'm going to, I'm going to go for add controller and add the second ID that I want a callback function to be attached to. So the new game button and the join game button, perfect. And then after I do that, I should be able to test that out. I should be able to click that button and see if I can't join that game. So let's go ahead and refresh. And so if I go to join game, it gives me the option to, uh, let's go ahead and get that ID. Well, actually that's all it's gonna do, right? Because I'm not fetching anything yet. I don't have an event listener on this view. So that is what we wanted to do. Be able to get to this screen. Now let's push this down some. Okay, perfect. So now that we can actually get to the join game view, the next thing we're gonna have to do is actually set it up so that when the end user presses this join button, right? It's going to trigger a event that's gonna fetch the game information the game state given this game id so here we're going to make another call to our backend server so let's go into our controllers and again as we already saw when we built this text field here at any time we build any of these text fields we give it an id so let's go ahead and be able to create a function that's going to allow us to get that the value from that so we're going to create a function get game ID, and all it's going to do is it's going to access the DOM, 
for the ID of ROM code and it's going to return the value from that text field. And the next thing I want to do is I want to now go into my uh, I want to go into my game script and I want to actually create a callback function that will then send a fetch to the back end server to be able to get the game that has that ID. So let's go here into our game script side of our game script. Again, every time we make a fetch to a back end server, that's going to have to be a asynchronous function because the fetch itself is an asynchronous function that we have to wait on. We're going to call this find game. Here, I'm going to uh, invoke from controllers the get game ID to be able to get whatever values inside this field. And once I do that, I'm going to use this string template, right? That's going to go ahead and embed that ID and hit that endpoint that, that performs the get on the server side. And then I'm going to await for a response. After I get a response, I'm going to, from the response object, try to get the JSON data that's embedded inside of it. That itself is an asynchronous function. So I'll wait on that, which will then resolve into being data. So one of the attributes that a response object has is a success attribute, right? It's not, and the reason why it's in there is because we've been putting it in there, right? That's not a default value that's inside of response. It's the one that our API embedded. So remember, every time we send back a response to a, a request when we design this, we make sure to put a success true or false. So if success attribute is true from the JSON that gets delivered to us, then we know that we should have a start attribute inside of that JSON response. We should have an end uh, value and we should have a game over value. So we'll go ahead and take those values and we will go ahead and overwrite our, our, our uh, min, max, and game over data here, right? All of our data attributes we've declared here. And then we'll invoke view game. So we'll update the view of our game from the join menu to the view game uh, view, or the, the, uh, the uh, join view to the view game view. And otherwise, if it wasn't a success, then we'll go back to the main menu. We'll redraw the main menu page. Excellent. Internet's a little unstable. Can everyone still hear me? Okay, so the next thing I need to do, every time I create these callback functions, it, am I still here? I'm gonna make sure I'm not lecturing to, to, uh, to no one at yeah, large. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Well, every time we create one of these functions that's supposed to do something, we have to make sure that it's tethered to one of the buttons that the user is going to press. So we're going to go into this get callbacks, right? And we're going to create a new key value pair. And don't forget, this is saying, it's giving me the squiggly lines because it's saying, hey, you forgot to give a com comma separating the key value pairs. So here I'm going to create a find game, uh, find game button key and I'm going to assign the find game function we just made to it. Great, and so once I do that, then I'm gonna update the join game menu function so that it adds the controller for that button. So I'm gonna go back to this view here, and this was inside of our join game menu. And here, that's where, that's where it has the ID find game button there. I'm going to go ahead and then add the controller for this find game button. And you see, it's just kind of doing this three-step process again and again. I decide what behavior I want to add. Then I go ahead and I determine how I'm going to tether that to the user interface. And then I decide what view I'm going to migrate to. Okay, so once I do that, I should be able to test this out. I should be able to join the game. And so recall right now, my view game, when I invoke that is still just gonna be a console log. So let me go, let's refresh. 
So let me click join game. When I go to join game, I have the ability to put a game ID. Let me go to the backend server. We already have a, um, a game currently in the server, right? With that ID. So let me copy that here and I'm gonna paste it in here. And again, I'm just some file protocol here, right? Like I'm not, all I do is send requests to my backend server. So I can have servers on actually two different platforms. This could be hosted on GitHub pages and then my backend server could be hosted on Heroku and that's completely fine because they interface with each other through HTTP. They don't interface by being on the same machine. Anyway, let me click this join button and oh, look at that. I got the, I got the data there. Excellent. So that was the success. And now let me refresh the page and let's see what happens if I try to join the game without and yeah, it brings me back to a main menu if it's not a valid game ID. Perfect, that's exactly the flow we want from our front end as well. So now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and build my game view. And so in order to build my game view, we're gonna update the view game function, right? Right now it's just on a console log, but now what we're going to do is we're actually gonna go ahead and have it display the HTML into our viewport. So I'm gonna to go to the Vue.js file. And I'm gonna update that view game method, that uh, function that we have. So now what I'm going to do instead of the console log is I'm gonna grab the view element, then I'm gonna create the HTML string, and then I'm gonna override the uh, view element with this new HTML. And just looking at this HTML, it's gonna create a new section. It's gonna have a heading element that's going to display the game ID. It's going to then have a paragraph that will get provide the min and max values that the users can guess from. It'll have an input field that has the ID guess input where the user can type in a guess. It'll have a submit button that has the ID uh, submit guess button that will probably be where we go ahead and submit our guesses. And then it's gonna have a unordered list with the ID clue list, which will then show this user what clues that they have already done. And then this will be managed client side. So each player in the game will have a different set of clues because they're all, all their clues are private to one another. So this is just an instance where we all the clients will depend on the server for some game data, but then you can also manage individual client data on just the client side. And the server doesn't even have to know what the, I mean, it does when it makes a guess, but it doesn't have to track those. Okay. And so once we do that, we should be able to just test this out. So let's do that. Let me go to a new game. Let's uh, start a game. And now, yeah, look at that. I now have my game view that gives me a game ID. And so that is now a new ID because I opted to make a new game and I have a min value, I have a max value, I have a place where I could put in a guess and then submit to it. So clearly the next thing I'm going to wanna do in this instance is uh, create a, um, a, an, a a event, uh, I want to create a action for submitting the guest to the backend server. So let's go and, well, first of all, we need to be able to get that guest. So let's go into our controllers and create one of those get methods. So let's go here into controllers and I'm gonna create a get guess method and all it's going to do is access the DOM and grab the element that has the guess input. So that's that text field here. And it's gonna grab the value that's in there and return it back from whatever function called that. So again, I don't wanna do that directly in the model. I just wanna build getters inside my controller so that my model isn't reliant on uh, understanding what the logic for accessing data from outside of it is. And then the next thing I want to do is actually create the function that submits a guest to the backend server. So let's go into our game.js file here. And here it's going to be, again, all these functions are going to be asynchronous functions because they're making requests to the backend server. 
right? Submit gas. We'll go ahead and then get the gas from this text field, right? And so then we'll have gas as a local variable. And then we're going to create the URL string, the endpoint that will allow us to send a gas to the backend server. So recall that uses the game ID and then slash gas. And then what we're going to do is embed that gas as a search parameter, right? So the key is gas. And then we'll go ahead and embed the value right there. And then we'll send that as a fetch to the backend server which will then we'll wait to get a response from. When we get a response, we'll wait for the response to deliver us the JSON data. Once we have the JSON data available, we can see if this was a successful action, a successful request. And if it is, recall that every time we have a guess, there's a multitude of states we can have, right? There's a guess property. It could be correct. It could be game over. It could be too low, it could be too high, or it could be error. So for this purpose, we're gonna search for one of two actions. If it is correct, we'll send an alert that, hey, you win. And if it's game over, then we'll send a, an alert, you lose. And if it's not uh, correct, so if you didn't get it right, or if it's not a game over, such that someone else already got it, then we're just gonna have a default case where we're going to redisplay uh, where we're gonna where we're gonna uh, display a clue. So we're gonna invoke a function called view clue, which is gonna be implemented inside of our views uh, script, and it's gonna send the guess from the response, and it's also going to go ahead and um, send the guess here. So this isn't the number of gas, this is the clue, right? The value of gas can either be too low or too high, right? Remember the state of gas is either correct, game over, too low, too high, or error. And then this second parameter is the actual numerical value of the gas that got submitted for this submit gas. So those are the two parameters we're gonna have for view clue, which we haven't written yet, we're about to write. So now let's go into our views here. And so here, view clues is going to be pretty simple. We're just going to take in as our first parameter the clue. The second parameter is the numerical value of the gas. We're going to grab the ID of that clues list, right? So that would be this unordered list here. And what we're going to do with that is we will then go ahead and append to the clues list, a list item that says the number is too high, too low, whatever the clue is. Excellent. And so now that we have that, uh, that callback function invoked, let's actually set up inside of our get callbacks so that we can bind an ID to a function. So I'm going to put a comma here and put a new entry. So for the submit, submit guess button, I want that to have the callback submit guess. So now what I can do here is go into the views and then we have to add that controller. So we'll add that controller into that view game. So that's where that button is initially created at. So notice, What's happening here is every time we're right authoring a button, we have to then give it the callback function, All right? So then we'll add the controller to this button we just created here. So make guess button, perfect. And then once I do that, I should be able to test this out. I should be able to test out all the different stages. I should be able to see if it's too low, if it's too high, if, um, if I get it correct or if I get a game over state. So I should get any one of these, right, that I, I should expect. So let's test this out. Let's go ahead and um, refresh. Let's just make a new game start. So now I have a new game made, right? There's my new game ID. Let's try to get too low. So I'm gonna do zero. So zero is too low. Let's try to do too high. 
So, yep, we got too high. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is, let's see what the actual number is. So the number is 124. Let's test 124. 124. Ah, oh, that gave us a win alert, All right? So an alert is a built-in browser function that will send like this little pop-up modal. So for testing purposes, this is just a proof of concept to show you how we can design a minimal viable product of a, a client side. We'll just use these. And then let's try to guess again. And now it's going to say you lose. And the reason why we lost that is because even though we use the right number, right, we had or someone had already guessed it. So you can, it's the first person who guesses it, who gets it. And then we'll hit, okay, perfect. So that is all the different states that we should expect from our game view, right? So if it's too low, we get a message. If it's too high, we get a message. If it's correct, we get a message. And if it's uh, after the game has won, we get the lose message. So the next thing we want to do is we want to actually have a game overview. So let's go into our views and create a function that will overwrite the view element with the contents of a game over. So let's go to views here. And then let's see what this is going to do. So here I'm going to create a function game over menu. It's going to be a function and it's going to require a result. So let the user know whether they won or lost, right? And so here I'm going to grab the view and then I'm going to create an HTML string. So I'm going to create a section element. Inside the section element, I'm going to put a heading that gives the game ID of the game we just played. And then it's going to have a game over paragraph that's going to contain the result that got passed into this function, whether we won or whether we lost. And then we'll have two buttons that we'll have to set up on here. One of these will be to be able to replay the same game. Or the second will be to go ahead and bring us to the main menu uh, of our app. And so since these are two buttons that we'll have to put event listeners on, we'll give them ID, reset game button, and quit game button. And then we'll overwrite the, the view with the HTML. So the next thing we need to do is let's go ahead and uh, mutate the state of those um, alerts that we just did so that we can actually render or change our views. So let's go back to where we were doing those alerts. That was inside of game. So here, we're doing the alerts, right? Those did the pop-ups. Now, we did that as a test, right? But what we actually want to do with those is we actually want to those to be invoking functions inside of our view script. So now we're going to invoke that game over menu with either a win message if it was correct or a you lose message if it was a game over. Excellent. And then let's refactor our view game, right? Such that if the game is over, right? That's one of the values we get from the uh, from our data. If the game is over, then we'll tell it game over, you lose, right? And the reason we have to do this is we only get this lose message on the instance that we're submitting the guess, but you might have other players who were trying to load into the game initially. And we have to also let them know that when they initially load into the game, whether the game is over or not. So they know that they can't guess. So that's why inside of our view game, if you try to view a game that's been over, you will get the losing message. So here, if game over, and again, that's data that is tracked here, right? Game over is one of the variables in our data. So if game over is true, then we'll instantly overwrite the view with a game over. Perfect. Did we ever set game over though? I don't know if we set that or not. Okay, let's see here. Let me see. I think, did we set that? Let me double check. 
min max start game find game yeah we did right here so that's where all of our data is being set when we initially get the game data perfect okay so now once we've done that let's go ahead and test this let us refresh let me go to join game and since I'm going to join a game that's already over, right, this is a game we, we tested last time and we got it right. So let me type this in here. Let me refresh. Let's just do this new game, start new game. I don't remember. Okay, so we have this. Let's see. So with this game here, we have. 974. Okay, and then we got the game over, you win. Perfect. And then we have the option for replay or main menu. And presumably, I should make sure that this is the case. If we um, go back to main menu, let's refresh. Go to join game. Oh, it should be. Double check to make sure that if game over is false, if game over is true. We should do. Okay. This should be getting. Oh, we haven't. Yeah, when we did that, it should be. True, that's interesting. Let's we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Let's take a look at our game over variable. It is true. Why, why are you not triggering? Okay, so let's take a look at our views really quick. And this is why we test things out. So if game over, then for game over menu, oh, I put that in the wrong place. That's supposed to go inside a view game. Again, Incredibly important why we test things out. <laughs> so in the view game, if the game is over, we instead want to effectively do a redirect. We want to instantly redraw to game over, you lose. Okay, so let's grab this again. Let's go to join game. And now let's join the game that's over. And yeah, perfect, you lose. Okay. Excellent. So why right, testing is super valuable. Oh, I see. Yeah, you notice that Ivan, very good job. Okay, and then the next thing I wanna do here is I wanna go ahead and uh, actually implement those actions on my game overview, right? So I'm gonna create a reset game function that's again going to send a request to my backend server. So let me go to my game here. So reset game, it's just gonna do a URL using the game ID that we have inside of our data to build out the URL. We'll send that fetch to the backend server. And then I'll use the, I'll just use the then method here. So you can see what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do response and then after the response, I'll tell it to view the game. So I threw in a then, so you can see another way that we can implement these, these concepts. So this will only, it'll only then uh, update the, uh, the view game after we get back the, the new JSON data. Okay, so now that we have a callback function, let's go and update our dictionary of our key value, our ID to callback function pairings inside of our controllers. So let's go here and add a comma and add that. And then once I do that, we can then go ahead and add a controller into our game over menu. So let's go to our views. And so inside of our game over menu, after we build the button, we need to go ahead and add a controller to it. 
And then we can just quickly test that out such that if the game is over, we can see if we can. So let me grab this ID here. OK, so let me re uh, refresh, uh, join game, join the game that's already over. So you lose. Let me try to replay. Make sure that, here we go, number, we do uh, reset game. Reset game is, yep, on our replay. Let's refresh. Let's join the game. Go here. Oh, and it refreshed. Just in, it didn't update my page. But it did work because presumably we should have a new number, which I can't see. Oh, is it? No, I can't see it. I don't, was it 974? I don't think it was 974. We can try the old number. No, so it's a whole different number. And now I can't see it because the state's been mutated. Okay. And then the last thing I want to do though, is I want to go ahead and also implement the quick game button. So this is a really simple thing to do, right? I'm just going to add a key value pair. And really the only thing we have to do is uh, invoke a function we've already made. So if I go into my controllers, I have two buttons that are, um, let me, that are part of that. I'm gonna have to get a game over again, but I'm gonna join another game. Anyway, so I'm gonna do uh, for the, uh, here, let's go in here. For the quit game button, I'm going to have it invoke the main menu function. And then inside of my views, right, inside of my game over, I'm gonna pass it two IDs, one for the reset game button and the other, which is going to set up the event listener for my quit, for my quit game button, perfect. Okay, so then let's refresh this and um, let's create a new game. Let's see what, this is perfect. Uh, it's 17. Oh, well, it's a low number. 17. And then I will submit. And then instead of replaying, I want to go to main menu. And bam, it brings me to the main menu where I can either go to new game or join. And so for the most part, I believe that that is it. So here, yep, game ID, you win. And then we opt to go to a uh, main menu, which brings us back here. Excellent. And so that's just a quick MVP, minimal viable product, where we would create effectively a front end that interfaces between our end user and our back end uh, services, web services, to build out a multi layered application that has a front end and back end responsibilities. So in this lab, we learned about a front end REST client for our multiplayer high low game. And so we covered again, async await, which we've done already before. We've done DOM manipulations, HTTP. We've all done these concepts before. I think the, the interesting thing here is that we used a service that we designed ourselves. So some future improvements you might wanna to do to this application, you might wanna style it, maybe add usernames, for the game and maybe show the names and a win record and a scoreboard, maybe synchronize the users together and display who is playing. You could do web sockets to do like real time two way data transfers, uh, maybe store the games in a database as opposed to just on the server and maybe deploy it on Heroku so you could actually play this with other people. But this should start to give you a good firm understanding of how we can start using the technologies we've been learning about individually together. This is the first like kind of lab sequence that brought those things together. Excellent. So we are done with this lab. Um, is there any questions that anyone has? So I have a question. Do I know why you might not, be, you can't replay from a second user who just logged into the game, which has already been won? Um, now, actually, we'll do some debugging on that. You should be able to send in the request. So if you're a second user, 
And if you just logged in, you should be able to issue to either replay or you should be able to uh, go to back to the main menu if that game is already over. So if it's not working, we'll take a look at the code to find out what's causing the issue there. I don't know off the top of my head. So with that said, I think what I'll do here is, and, uh, and if I do, if there is any issues, what I'll do is I'll put a comment in the YouTube section that has whatever updates might have to go in there. So I think that'd be a good place to be able to leave additional comments for corrections and whatnot. Okay, everyone have a great day. Let me stop recording. Mm -hmm.